As you move into your older and wiser years, you may have questions about your finances, your health, or what to do for fun besides watching young people try to figure life out. Oh, man, this guy's a moron! The next hour is dedicated to you. Only the good die young. This is 50 Plus. Cause women never age and old school will always be cool. Only the good die young. 50 Plus. Brought to you by the UT Health Consortium on Aging. Informed decisions for a healthier, happier life. Here's Doug Pike. Welcome aboard. Thanks for listening to 50 Plus. Wherever you may be, we're going to expand the range of this program one city at a time. Slowly but surely, total domination of the United States. And then we'll talk about the world. Going to talk ENT today. Only the E for this hour is going to be eyes instead of ears. I've got an ophthalmologist who specializes in cataract surgery coming up behind this segment. And then we'll finish up later with an allergy man who I'm actually told is a pretty good golfer. Between Houston and Raleigh, I'm, I'm guessing he and I could find a couple of nice courses to play this spring. Uh, we'll discuss some of what causes our heads to feel like they're absolutely going to explode this time of year. I, I'm already getting it here in Houston. I don't know about you guys in Raleigh, but over here, whatever it is that's in the air uh, just can can strike me without warning, and it fills my head up in seconds. I, we'll discuss some of that, and uh, there's also a new procedure, actually, that this doctor and a few in his office do that just might stop that feeling that, sudden onset of allergy problems forever. Fingers crossed. I may try it myself. With the show uh, also airing in Raleigh, I wanted to look around there electronically anyway and kind of see what's available for seniors. The state's got some really great programs, uh, from what I found anyway, and and I know there's a solid medical community in the region. I hope they're as attentive to seniors there as we are over here in Houston with UT Health's Consortium on Aging. Fine sponsor of this program, as a matter of fact. Theme this morning's intro theme of this morning's intro uh, research, I guess, since I was doing so much of that on Raleigh. And, and most of that's going to be done at least uh, fastest anyway on the Internet. Now you can dig out your old encyclopedias and blow the dust off of them if you want to. But the Internet's going to be the way to go. I don't know if uh, you know how to use the Internet. If you don't, some of you who are older and have stubbornly avoided it, you need to learn. Almost every city in America now has got free basic computer classes for seniors somewhere. You might not make a new friend there, but if you know how to use the Internet, uh, you can make all the friends you want. You kind of need to be careful, actually. Before you buy a computer, by the way, either borrow one from a friend or maybe go to the library and look up some of the machines made specially for seniors. Mostly, from what I can tell, they're not going to be the same. They're, they're going to have oversized keys, maybe. On the keyboard, they're going to maybe be color-coded in places where you might need that. Some of that software even offers up shortcuts for writing letters or paying bills online, things some of us do pretty often. My thoughts at 60 now, oh, my God, I'm 60, are that most of us can learn the basics and get pretty functional on the computer without buying special machines. You can increase the font size on a monitor to whatever's best for you. You can get used to that keyboard if you use it often enough. And in a pinch, you can use color-coded tape maybe to fix some of the keys. Working on a computer isn't, isn't a whole lot different than maybe driving a car or cooking, really. The more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to become with it. Buy a senior computer if you like, but before you lay down your money, get one of your children or maybe a trusted younger friend to take a look at the deal. No matter what age you are, no matter what you're looking at, there is still no such thing as something for nothing. There is no free lunch now, most of the computer companies that cater to seniors are great, honest companies, but I have seen reviews as well that say otherwise about a couple of them. I have. Oh, by the way, in Houston, coming up on March 4th, it's right around the corner, coming up on March 4th, Houston Medical Journal is hosting a health, health spit it out, Doug, health care career fair. That's going to be, again, March 4th from 11 to 2 at the Hilton Garden Inn in Sugarland, Texas. I don't know how many times I've had to say when I'm ordering things online or when someone's asking my address, I, I automatically now default to Sugarland two words because invariably they'll try to spell it with one, and I think that's the way the the band named Sugarland spells it. 
that correct, Simpson? My producer, yes. Sugarland, one word there. Sugarland, two words where I live. And about two times the size it was when I moved in there many years ago. As a ju- well, you can't call me a junior when I'm younger than 55, but they're certainly quick to call me a senior where I am now. So anyway, that's the Houston Medical Journal's Healthcare Career Fair. Got 150 positions to fill. And I think 15, 16, maybe 18 different companies out there trying to fill the spots. Uh, young or old, happy or sad, whatever you are, if you're in the mood for a different gig and you know a little bit about healthcare related professions, might not be a bad idea to jump in there. March 4th, 11 to 2, Hilton Garden Inn. Uh, there's an information number here, 281 491 7777. Hey, if you're in Raleigh looking for a change of scenery, maybe this is your chance. Jump on a jet plane. Come over here to Houston. Uh, you'll like the weather, certainly. Raleigh, probably not too terribly cold in the wintertime. Not entirely unlike Houston, probably a little drier. That's a safe bet. All right, there you go. After the break, we'll talk with Dr. Nan Wong about cataracts. And after I'm done with Dr. Wong, we'll go on to Dr. Robert Palmer. No, not that Robert Palmer. This is the MD Robert Palmer, who's also a pretty good doctor. Talk about allergies with him, new ways to cure them. Boy, I can't wait to hear that. I need to find out about that. Allergies didn't come on for me until I was older. But, boy, are they making up for lost time. All of that on 50 Plus right after this. Old guys rule. And um, women never get old. If you want to avoid sleeping on the couch. Mm. Okay, well, I think that sounds like a good plan. 50 Plus continues. Here's more with Doug. I could. There was a time when I could hit those notes. I'm afraid that time has passed. Welcome back to 50 Plus. Thanks for listening. I certainly do appreciate it. I will push this button and magically will appear Dr. Nan Wong, cataract surgery specialist with UT Health Science Center and at the Robert Sizzik Eye Clinic here in Houston. Dr. Wong, welcome to the program. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I Thank you for the time. I'll go back to the interview 101 and start with the what question on this. Uh, what exactly are cataracts? Cataract is a condition that results in the cloudiness of the lens of the eye that can impair your vision. Oh, a lot of people over 50, over 65 mm-hmm. uh, have cataract. Who generally tends to get a m- more women than men, more what? Uh, men and women have equal risk of developing cataract, okay. but each person develops cataract at their own pace. And that, well, when you say at your own pace, I presume that... Uh, before the end of the road for most of us, if we live long enough, we're going to be there, huh? You are absolutely right. Uh, mm, I don't like to hear that. All right, so any social factors connected to cataract development work, environmental, genetic, anything there? Uh, there may be some genetic factors. Mm-hmm. For example, certain families that tend to have a, have a tendency to develop cataract early, they may have a tendency to develop cataract earlier than their peers. But if we live long enough, <laughs> each one go. of us will have cataract. Oh, you go right back to that every time. No environmental factors, no work-related factors that you guys know of yet? Um, if you follow the... Um, the regulations, for example, we know radiation does result okay. in, in in cataract. But if you follow the workplace regulations, then you should then that should not affect your eyes. I don't work with a whole lot of radiation around here, so I think I'll be okay. Let's let's move forward to the when. Then you, you mentioned younger, older. Uh, when do cataracts typically show up? You know, there are different kinds of cataracts. Okay. Uh, the most common one we call age-related cataract is the, the one that we've been talking about is the one that most people get if they live long enough. So it's part of the aging changes. But you can also have a cataract after you're, just right after you're born. It's called a congenital cataract. And then these are not inherited, but it's just because the developmental abnormalities, so you can be born with cataract or young children for 
Yeah. One reason or the other can also develop cataracts. So age is not a definite factor. I hate hearing that for kids. That's just they've got enough things to do trying to grow right. up, huh? There's other conditions can cause cataract. There are medical conditions, for example, diabetes. There is a treatment, for example, radiations. These things we call a secondary cataract. They're the side effect from the primary condition. And then also another one, let's not forget trauma. Mm -hmm. Trauma can result in cataract as well. So these are the, the large category of cataract. Basically, even though cataract is most common in older folks, you can develop cataract at any age for any sex. What sort of trauma does it take? Is it direct trauma to the eye or can it be to the head or... Yeah, it's a usually direct trauma okay. to the eyes okay. or periocular area. It can be just a, a trauma to the head, for example, a fall or something struck you on the side of the face can also cause cataract. What about, there's so much talk about football players getting concussions now. Can concussion cause cataracts down the road? Is there any contributory? Concussion it? is a different condition. Okay. Um you know, usually uh, for football players, it's not the most common cause of cataract because they mm -hmm. do wear uh, a helmet uh, when their when their head bounces on the uh, with the cool counter cool uh, movement. Mm -hmm. It's the brain that get bruised, um, not necessarily for the eye. We see probably more baseball injuries, oh. uh, the smaller one, pinball injuries, mm -hmm. or in school pencils. Pencil injuries oh, are boy. very common. There is a, a story. Some, if we ever meet and get a chance to talk face to face, remind me to tell you the story about my son with pencils. Uh, it was one of the biggest medical mysteries of all time. We were ready to call uh, anybody and everybody and get him on TV, and then it was suddenly solved. It's a long, funny story. Are, are cataracts something that a family doctor typically would notice or inquire about even during a routine exam? The family doctor usually inquires about it, especially if the patient does complain of uh, blurry vision. Mm -hmm. But the family physician don't usually have the diagnostic tools and the equipment to make a firm diagnosis. So okay. most of the time, the family physician will refer you to an eye care specialist. And so when someone gets cataracts, how you, you mentioned blurriness. What other impact might that have on somebody's vision? Or is that it, really? That's enough, I guess. Well, there's a lot of things that people, you know, complain about cataracts. For example, blurness is, is the most common one. Mm -hmm. However, the, the the color will be dull. Usually, has a yellow, dull color compared to normal. People just didn't realize because the onset is gradual. So it's day in, you know, each day by day. So they didn't detect a sudden change. It's only after they get treated they see such a big difference between a cataract eye and non cataract eye. Other things can call, you know, cataract patients can experience maybe a glare during the day it's just mm. the sunlight makes them difficult to see or halos and glares at night they cannot drive at night with incoming traffic light they just blind their eyes that's quote unquote mm -hmm. they may also experience um, like a double vision or uh, shadows that they almost sometimes see a second image oh, wow. uh, one yeah so they won't be able mm. to see clearly one more how question, just general, let's say uh, in people 50 to 65, you mentioned you know, past 80, pretty much everybody's going to have them. What about 50, 60? What's the percentage of the population that probably got cataracts to some degree? Yeah, about 50 years of age, you often, you know, mid-50s, you do see early changes in the lenses, so they technically do have a cataract, but they're not, we call them visually significant, which means we can still correct their vision to a functional level. You know, in the mid-60s is where you see a lot more people who have cataract to the point that their vision cannot be corrected to the point that they it will be adequate for the activity of daily living. Interesting. And what goes into a formal diagnosis of cataracts? You mentioned that the, the GP is probably not going to be able to help you with that, but when somebody finally makes it uh, into uh, an eye doctor's chair, not necessarily all the way to you, a, a surgeon who specializes in this, but just any eye doctor, what are they going to do to make sure it's cataracts and not something else? They will do a very thorough history taking mm -hmm. and a physical exam. The history taking, you know, involves everything. We want to know your history, uh, what medical conditions you have, what treatment you have, for example, radiation, certain medications. All of these are taken into consideration. And then it's a thorough, full exam. We will check your vision. We check different layers of the eye from the very front, from the eyelid, the cornea, which is the cover of the eyes, mm -hmm. the fluid field chamber behind the cornea, the pupil, the lens, 
which is where the cataract is located. And in addition to that, we also look beyond the lens. We have to dilate your pupil, look at the vitreous cavity to see if there's anything, blood in the vitreous cavity or opacities, and look at the retina to see if the retina is healthy. Only through a thorough examination can we diagnose whether you have cataract and whether the cataract is the main reason for you not to see well. It takes a special kind of person to be able to dig around in somebody's eyes, doesn't it, Doc? i got to hand it to you. Are there, are there other diseases that kind of present themselves with symptoms that might look like cataracts? There's a lot of okay. other conditions can cause blurriness. Mm-hmm. For example, you can have vitreous hemorrhage, like I discuss a lot of people who have diabetes right. did not know they just have bleeding in the back part of the eye that's beyond the lens but they did not know it's you know mm-hmm. it's blurry vision so unless you get examined the patient not necessarily be able to tell whether they have a cataract or they have glaucoma another you know older person disease and blinding disease they will not be able to tell because none of this condition cause pain cause redness oh, they just cause blurry vision mm. here's one that you didn't mention that can cause blurry vision and that's a tequila you mentioned you missed that one. Let, so the stay. one I haven't mentioned is macular degeneration, oh, which yeah. is also painless loss Ooh, of vision. Oh but tequila is something else. Something altogether different. Dr. Nan Wong with us here this morning. Let's stay on the optimistic side a minute before we get into into your office and, and maybe an operating room. What sort of non-surgical treatments and medications are available to treat cataracts? In the early stages of cataract, um, Often when we change the prescriptions, uh, we can get you get the patient to see fairly well, even though not perfect. It's, we call it functional, and that's what I, we recommend do either glasses or contact lens. You may have to change glasses and contact lens more often than you used to because the changing in your vision. But as long as your vision is adequate to do your activity of daily living, that's what we usually recommend you to do. And this, this is just going to be temporary fixes, isn't it, on the way to probably a more permanent condition? Correct, but you know the the speed of the cataract development, especially for we call the most common type, which is called age related cataract, is often not very dramatic. So it takes some time. That time okay. can be months to years. That's so good. that's why we recommend you to change glasses. Well, months to years we don't have, but a few minutes we will for a break here. Doctor Nan Wong joining us this morning. We're talking about cataracts. When we get back, uh, we'll get into some of the surgical alternatives or surgical treatments at least for cataracts i'll ask the good doctor to go on hold here for just one moment there she goes we will be back with more 50 plus i've got boy i've got some questions for her also got these little floaters in my eye. maybe i'll ask about that and other things that will affect our eyes as we get older i just want to still be able to drive and see fish and that's about enough for me more 50 plus after this Life improved with age. Pour yourself another glass of 50 plus with Doug Pike. Raise your glasses, everybody. No, not that kind of glass. It's not with Dr. Wong on the phone. It's the other kind of glass. Let me get her back on. The other kind of glasses, huh, Dr. Wong? You don't want to do that. That goes back to that tequila thing. We need to steer clear of that. Vision loss because of alcohol is nothing that has anything to do with what we're talking about. We're talking about cataracts here. Dr. Wong, a cataract surgery surgery specialist with UT Health Science Center and at the Robert Sizzik Eye Clinic in Houston. If somebody winds up in your office, Dr. Wong, what surgical options are they looking at for cataracts? If the cataract has reached to the point that uh, it's interfering with patient activity of daily living, and then we will recommend to have cataract, sur- cataract surgery to have the cataract removed. Cataract surgery is probably one of the most commonly performed surgical procedures done in the United States, wow. and the, the success rate is phenomenal. Excellent. It's an outpatient surgery uh, with usually local anesthesia. Patient come in there, have surgery, go home, use drops, see great the next day. Wow. Can I come in and get it done in advance? 
Uh, what do you mean in the vest? <laughs> Before I even get a cataract, just just polish up the glass and, and let me see better starting tomorrow. No, uh, there's really no oh. need to do that. Uh, right. Usually we sure. replace the body part of one is, you know, right. impaired. So before it impaired, it really this is not something, it's not like a tumor treatment. Right. It's not like a cancer. You're preventing from bad things happening. We know this is something that will happen even though you're perfectly healthy. It's just the one is reaching a point. It then we will replace it. Before that, there's no need to do that. How far do you have to get? How, how badly do you have to see before you become a candidate for surgery? Most people regarding, uh, you know, driving vision to be the the mm, yeah, uh, the point. limit, you know, if, because we all have our own independence. Mm-hmm. Driving is one of the major things, especially down in our neck of the wood. So if your vision falls behind the driving requirement, that usually is considered visually significant. However, depending on your occupational requirement, some people obviously has higher requirement than others. For example, I'm a surgeon. I need to have both eyes seeing well Mm -hmm. and to both eyes work together in order to do the work that I do. So my vision requirements are different than, for example, an 80-year-old who does TV watching most of the time and does not drive. So we do take that into account. We Good ask point. our patient, what do you do, whether it, your vision is interfering with what you need to do. And if somebody just says, I don't want to bother with this, it's only going to get worse and not better, right? Correct. Yeah. Not only your vision will get worse, sometimes in the advanced stage of a cataract, it can cause secondary complications. For example, we call it a phacomorphic glaucoma. Hmm. The, uh, the cataract continue to grow. Physically, the new lens cells will pack into the old one. Nothing get lost. So the hmm. lens or the cataract not only get cloudier, it also physically get bigger. When it get to a certain point, it will uh, push on certain structures of the eyes, make the drainage of the fluid impaired, and that's called a secondary glaucoma. So it can have complications later on. So for medical reasons, you need to get them removed. Let's talk, boy, this is all such cheerful news, but I guess in the end you, there are treatments and you can, um, you can add a lot of years to your visual life if you just mind your eyes. Let's, Dr. Nan Wong joining us this morning from UT Health. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other things that affect, affect senior vision. Uh, maybe some of these little floaters I'm seeing. I've, I've had somebody explain it before, but why don't you take a run at it for somebody who's new to the program? You know, the floaters are usually, we call the vitreous floaters. These are the ones that people describe that usually it's in one eye. It can be in both eyes, but they are different. So it's in each eye. You can see like a mosquito or a spider web or a little little dot that swing by, a little cloud that flow by. They're usually moving. Mm-hmm. And some of the t- most of the time, it's obvious when you look at the blank background, for example, a blue sky or a blank wall, and then they float around. These are what we call the vitreous floaters. Yes, they, they are do. the inhomogeneities in the vitreous cavity. Now, vitreous cavity is the a big, it's the bigger cavity in the eye that sits behind the lens and in front of the retina, so it sits behind the cataract. It, it, when you're young, it's kind of a jelly-like material. As you get older, the chemical composition changes, so it become more liquidy. And then in that structure, there's invisible, like a transparent scaffolding that get collapsed as you get older. Oh, great. And that's, the, that's the stuff, the inhomogeneity is in that vitreous cavity that you're seeing, so it's part of your own tissue. I don't remember the first time I saw one of those, but I remember, and just like you say, when you're looking at a blue sky or a blank wall, something like that, if there's, if there are things in your line of vision to distract you, you rarely see them. But that's, and I was probably knowing what I do for a living and whatnot, outdoors somewhere looking at a blue sky, and just like you said, where'd that bird come from? Where'd that mosquito come from? What was that? And you just, finally, you, you just get used to them. That's all you can do, I guess, with those. Now, flashes, I'm told, are a different story altogether. Um, 
you know, the, the, the floaters, actually, if there is one time in your life, usually you suddenly see a lot more floaters. And that's usually about, you know, after age 40, and then there is an incident of called vitreous detachment. Ooh, we don't then, want that. Yeah, the, no, the vitreous detachment is like how its aging changes. But when that happens, you suddenly have, we call a shower of floaters, there's mm. a lot more. And that's the time you really need to come in to have the eye examined because you very rarely you can have a tear in the retina. Mm. And if we find it early, we can seal it off with laser so you don't end up having a retina detachment. I just want, you know, most of the time, if you don't have that, we, we tell you to live with the floater. So that's exactly what you're saying. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in the, you know, after age 40, when there's a shower of floater, suddenly something appeared, that is a time it's critical that you come in to see your eye care professionals to have it checked out. Yeah, I know one guy in all the men and women I've ever known who had a bona fide retinal detachment, and that was pretty creepy. He he got to it quickly and was able. They were able to save that eye, but it was it was a mess. Let's let's move from there to glaucoma, which is actually a group of eye diseases, isn't it? That is correct. I did my research. Give me a little background on glaucoma and what it does to us. Yeah, the glaucoma is a group of eye disease that. Uh, typically resulted from a uh, fluid uh, dynamic imbalance inside the eye that result in the eye pressure being high. And then uh, the high pressure damaged the eye nerve. Think about the eye nerve as a cable connecting your eye to the brain. So okay. it sends the information from the eye to the brain. So when that nerve get damaged, you can have a perfectly looking eye, but you're not going to see well because you're not mm -hmm. able to send the information from your eyes to the brain, which is the, the computer CPU, which process the information. But there is a group of disease. Um, the glaucoma have, we call open angle, go closed angle. Mm. Most of the people who have open angle glaucomas don't even feel the pain. So they just gradually lose vision. That's what we call the painless loss of vision or the silent killer. However, there's a you know small percentage of people who has, we call acute glaucoma with angle closure glaucoma. Those people usually do have pain. They have a red, eyes red, painful, tearing, have nausea, vomiting, and they have they come to the emergency room. So it's, it's a group of diseases. Also, you can develop glaucoma as you get older, which is common, but you can also be born with glaucoma, uh, just sort of like born with cataracts. So Do you, it's not inherited, but it, Dr. Does, it does tend to run in family. I'm, I'm out of time. Thank you. It sounds to me like glaucoma is kind of like the cable between my satellite dish and my TV. Thank you very <laughs> much. We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye. Glad to be here. Thank you. Where been there and done that actually means been there, done that. And this is just the beginning. This is 50 Plus with Doug Pike. <laughs> 50 Plus, we're back. Welcome. Thank you for hanging around. We're going to talk a little bit about allergies here in just a second. Dr. Wong, it was kind of funny. I was laughing with my producer, James Simpson, about how right as we get to the end every time, the, the timing just goes out the window and the doctors have so much they want to convey to you guys. Uh, I guess that's probably a good reason not to for me to blab and go ahead and get Dr. Robert Palmer on the phone from the American Sinus Institute. How are you today, Doc? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. You're part of the team over at ASI, the American Sinus Institute. Uh, how do we say it? you what you unstop stop noses? Does that sum it up pretty well? Yeah, that's sort of that sort Kinda. of like that. <laughs> got to keep it simple. You got to get too technical, and then the people don't understand. Good point. Yeah, yep. we help people breathe. Uh, we reduce sinus infections. We reduce headaches. Those are the three things that bother people that have allergies. Well, you know, yeah, I'm, there's a lot of allergies. My hand went higher and higher in the air as you spoke right then. I'm already feeling some allergic related allergy related issues i guess it would be and, and it's not even spring yet it's going to be a, a long year for me if this keeps up but before we get to the surgery that you guys do though let's let's go kind of general and talk about what's in the air now that's going to start eating us up and what maybe some over-the-counter allergy meds might do well the problem we're having right now is that we're getting such early spring the mm -hmm. trees are already budded oak you name it elm yep everything's uh you know, produces allergens in a way. And so if you look around, it's everywhere right now. And uh, 
what happens is just causes you to get headaches and get drainage and itchy eyes and so on. So, you know, to treat it, you really need to take an antihistamine. Over the counter is fine, mm-hmm. like Claritin. But you have to start it and you have to stay on it. You know, once you release histamine, it's going to do its dirty job and cause inflammation. So if you just take an antihistamine and think it's going to go away immediately, it's not. So if you know you're allergic to something in advance, Good point. get on your antihistamine sooner and stay on it for about two to three weeks. And if the allergen is the air for six weeks, stay on it for six weeks. But don't wait until it starts because then you'll have a delay in the effect. That's a good idea. You know, I hadn't even thought about that because I always do kind of just wait around and, and hope that it won't happen to me today, even though it happened yesterday and the day before. And, exactly. We all yeah. wait. Golly. All right. So, oh, well. And, and what they do, I guess, really, they don't they, – they take away the symptoms, but they don't really address the root problem, do they? No, well, in a way, it, they yet. take away the symptoms, and they're yeah. addressing the problem. The problem okay. with sinuses, they have to be ventilated, mm-hmm. and repeated allergy attacks can cause those little openings to slam shut and not open. So when you get into that, then you have recurring headaches, recurring infections, uh, yep. uh, and you can't breathe. Yeah, that can't so breathe. That's where, tough. that's where the Sinus Institute steps in. We mm-hmm. treat allergies as well. I think it's important to treat your allergies, and we even treat them with shots. You know, we do studies and find out what you're allergic to and then recommend shots to suppress the reaction. But in addition to that, if you've closed your sinuses down, then that's where we come in, and uh, we do it both. Yeah, both I may the allergies have, and the surgery. I may have a little bit of that, a little bit of all of that going on. I'm still waiting for the for the the pollen. The, the trees have budded and everything's kind of going on. I've got a neighborhood full of oak trees, and I'm just waiting for that first morning that the entire hood of my truck is yellow because oh, it's yeah. it's coming, man. It's everywhere, and if that, you're allergic to that, you get hammered here. Oh yeah, and the older I get, the the worse my allergies seem to get. Is that common? Is that normal? Yeah, I think so, because, okay. you know, you've had re- re- bout after bout after mm-hmm. year, you've sort of compromised the system. You know, you keep having allergies every year, and before you know it, it seems like you have them all the time because you build up this inflammation in the nose so you can't breathe. And then you build up the obstruction to the ventilation areas, and then they, they right. cause this pressure and headaches. So yeah. you're exactly right. If you, don't, if you don't stay on top of it, you know, it becomes a recurring problems and get worse and on a personal note oh by the way a world-class deviated septum yeah. the the rodeo coming up here in houston anyway all sorts of things out there that could trigger an allergic reaction aren't there oh incredible <laughs> i mean think about it. if you're allergic to animals the dander Oops. plus the hay mm-hmm. is going to be there so the rodeo is a is a place where if you know you've got allergies to grasses you should get on antihistamine before you go to the rodeo. A lot of people go several times. They just don't go one night. You know, they go for several events. So if you're gonna, if you're one of those, it's really advisable before the rodeo starts to get on an antihistamine at least three or four days before, so you can fully enjoy it, not uh, not just get hammered. It's really, this is probably one of the most eye-opening things that one of the docs has said on the show is to be very proactive with allergies because I was always concerned that I would be taking the antihistamine too much and and it, I would you know I would end up with a, a nose that wouldn't react to the antihistamine you're saying just kind of the opposite almost get get in front of it huh exactly what Good. you're talking about are decongestants oh okay decongestants are wonderful drugs mm-hmm. they work fast they work immediately so let's say for example you didn't get on your antihistamine you go to the mm-hmm. rodeo and your nose slams shut mm-hmm. take a, de- a de- uh, you know anti I mean a decongestant for a few days or even a spray but you can't use those on a regular basis. Those right. are temporary. They should only be used for three or four days at a time okay. to give you immediate relief. But to prevent your allergies, that's where the antihistamine comes in. Okay. So you need to be proactive with antihistamine. Good point. Very so important. Let's say somebody shows up at your office now and says, man, I was out at the rodeo sniffing cows, and all of a sudden my head filled up. Uh, what can you do for me? What, what are you going to tell that person? How are you going to start the, uh, the interview process with that patient and see just what they need? Well, I'd, you know, just do a little history on it, mm-hmm. find out what I think they're allergic to. But if they have an, if they're having a real acute episode that has really shut them down, I'll give them a steroid shot. Okay. Okay. Intermuscular there. steroid shot that works good, it works fast. It's a temporary thing, but that gets you, gets you out of that acute situation. And then I put them on antihistamine. Say, now you had the steroid shot. You say you're having a problem with uh, cedar, which we don't have a big problem here, but it's mm-hmm. here. It's worse than Central Texas. But, you know, that goes on for about eight weeks. So mm-hmm. they come in, they're miserable, you give them a steroid shot, you put them on the antihistamine and maybe a little bit of Flonase, which is a topical steroid, and say, look, you stay on that for the next eight weeks. 
Now, let me let me just roll one out here for you on a silver platter. So the same guy comes in and says, you know what? I'm getting five or six sinus infections every year. I can't breathe. I'm having a hard time sleeping. Is there anything you can really do for me? Is there anything unique to the American Sinus Institute? you see it coming? Unique to the American Sinus Institute. <laughs> what can you do for me? <laughs> we can fix that, and I mean oh, it's perfect. It's a, yeah. Sinus surgery has come a long way. This technique that Dr. Rubio has uh, developed, and we do on, on every patient the same way, it addresses all those issues because ultimately what happens, it's lack of ventilation, ventilation, mm-hmm. ventilation, ventilation. Right. You reestablish the ventilation with this technique that is so simple to do. It's not painful. You recover from it in three to four days, and you really feel good. And in addition to that, we treat the nasal passage so you can breathe better. So you ventilate, and you incre- improve their breathing. So what happens? You get rid of the headache, you can breathe, and you get rid of the recurring infection. So how long, somebody how- who's had how long has Go that ahead. technique been around? Uh, the balloon plasty has been around probably about six, seven years. Mm-hmm. But uh, it just, uh, in my mind, it wasn't used aggressively enough. It's okay. so less traumatic. Everybody can benefit from it. It's just, uh, it's just a wonderful technique that doesn't do any trauma to the nasal passages. It just sort of re- rehabilitates them. Local or it's, general anesthesia? We do a general anesthesia. Yeah. It can be done under local, but uh, <laughs> Rubia has come up with a technique where we lightly put them to sleep. Mm-hmm. We don't put a tube in their windpipe, okay. but we put them to sleep and allows us to do the operation between 15 minutes and 30 minute operation. That's not and bad. And they come in and they leave in about a half an hour later. Recovery time pretty quick, as you said. Then. Pretty quick. No packing in the nose. That's yeah, I need to know that before rodeo no season. No packing in the nose. I need to know that before rodeo season because I got bulls to ride, man. Go. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I let me. I'll just tell you. I rode one bull a long, long time. I was in my late teens. It was some little bull out at a local rodeo out west of Houston, and one of us had been drinking. I'm not going to tell you which one, but between the me and the bull, one of us had had a little drink. I stayed on about two seconds. That was long enough to know I didn't want to do it again. I can assure you. With you got that. smart real quick. Yeah, I did. Now I understand that you guys have some relationship with Johnson and Johnson over there. What's that? Yes, well, they're the people at Clarence. They're the people that uh, have perfected and developed the balloon that Dr. Rubio oh, uses. Oh, okay. And it's a wonderful device. I mean, it's just so slick. It's it's very similar. to I guess it's a reminiscent of the cardiologist when they pass those catheters up and do the balloon plastic mm-hmm. for your artery. Well, we do the same thing with this flexible uh, balloon, and we open up the passages. That's how it works. It's just worked out really good. He helped develop it. There's a really good chance this could work for me, too. I'll get, I've got to get over there. I need to talk to Joe Pogge and set up a time to come meet you guys and just let you take a look anyway. I might be a candidate for this. Is insurance going to cover it? i got about a minute. They will. Good. That's, well, that's, about it. that's a beautiful thing there. All right, to find out more about the American Sinus Institute and this Enrubia technique and the balloon up your nose, very simple, 713 balloon. How easy is that? If you can't spell balloon, look it up. Dr. Robert Palmer from the American Scientist Institute. Thank you so much. I do appreciate your time, Doc. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. You bet. I'll come see you. All right. All right. All right. We're going to move on from there. We, Good heavens. We're almost out of time. We'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for listening to 50 Plus. You learned about cataracts. You learned about floaters. You learned about glaucoma. You learned about your nose. All those things that can make you itch and sniffle and uh, learn ways to make yourself feel better. Thanks for listening to 50 Plus. We'll do it again next week. Adios.